So for those who, who don't know, I'm pretty sure most of you have been around most of this year, or at least part of the year, we're doing a series called What Does God Want? And uh, we've been through a whole bunch of stuff, but we're in this process of looking at discipleship. And so I'm going to just cover some quick ground as to what, I've, what ground I've covered on, on this particular topic. And uh, as we said, remember that, that God created humanity out of a deep love for us. And in that process, what he did is he placed us in a garden, and then he gave us a mandate. And that mandate was to go and be fruitful, to multiply, to have dominion, and to go and extend Eden into the darkness of the world. And uh, Eden was a place where heaven and earth coexisted. And God has a heavenly family as well as an earthly family. And it talks about God's divine counsel, and we won't go into all of those right now. And Dave, thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> My throat's a little tight this morning. Some nice hot water. And... Uh, and part of this process is that uh, what happened then was that God disinherited the nations because the watchers came down, uh, they had sex with women, they created the Nephilim, they took humanity to a, another level of depravity, and that's why God brought the flood. But then what happens is we have the uh, Tower of Babel, and God disinherits the nations. He says, that's enough, I've had enough. And he starts again with Abraham, and that's kind of the Eden Mandate 2.0. And then we took, looked at Matthew 28, which is, again, what happens is, is, Humanity keeps going through this process of just not doing what God's called them to do. Israel become parochial. They don't extend who they're supposed to be into the earth. So God basically takes back control through Jesus. <laughs> and now we have Eden Mandate 3.0, which you and I are part of, to go and disciple the nations. And that's what we're called into. So that's kind of the backdrop. Now, what is a disciple? Well, a disciple is an apprentice of Jesus, learning from him on how to lead my life in the kingdom of God as he would if he were I. Or in other words, what we need to do is we need to be with Jesus to become like him, to do the things that he would do if he were you or me. Does that make sense? So it's not what, what would Jesus do, it's what would Jesus do if he were me. So it's not WWD, it's WWD, no, I didn't even try because I tried it just yesterday and it didn't go well. And then I talked about kingdom living. What is kingdom living? It's living in the reality of all the wonderful things that we see in scripture. And it really comes down to two things. It's living in the power and the character of Jesus. Or the power and the character, the power of the kingdom and the character of the Godhead. To be fully baptized, to be fully immersed in the Trinitarian God. And this is done by taking on the qualities of God. How do we become like Jesus? And how do we live that out in the way that God's called us to? And we demonstrate that through the power of the kingdom as we serve one another and we serve God. So kingdom living inc includes the following. It says, we acknowledge the kingdom of God in, all our, in, in every, every way. Because if we're only acknowledging God in the big things, actually most of our lives are made up of little things. Brushing our teeth, having a meal. Those are the things that we do continually. And what we, what, what, what's helpful is when we live in the kingdom of God, then when we sit down, we don't just go, oh, let's have grace because that's what we do as a ritual. No, we stop for a moment and say, Lord, thank you for this food. Although maybe sometimes taste it and then thank God. I'm just teasing. <clears throat> I'm just teasing. <laughs> not, not my wife, because she cooks. She's a great cook. <laughs> Recovery. Did you see that? <laughs> I called everyone to memorize scripture. And, and two scriptures in particular. How's that going? 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Colossians 3. We are looking to potentially expose the Colossians in the last block of this year from September. But the point is, is Colossians 3 is just a beautiful kind of scripture around what God has called us into in terms of kingdom living. Go and memorize those things because when you memorize it, it, it takes a hold of your heart. It takes a hold of your thinking and it changes the trajectory of what you're doing. So this is what I, what I said in terms of that was it's about concentration. It's about repetition, and it's about understanding. The more you understand, the less you have to do repetition. And when we start to understand what the Scripture is saying, and it starts to kind of bleed into us, as it were, or drip into us and feed us, and it becomes part of us, then what we do is we start to live that out, and it stabilizes us, and it enables us to live out the kingdom of God in our locality or where we might find ourselves. And the whole thing is this, the reward isn't like, oh, wow, I can, I can memorize Scripture. The reward is that we get transformed, that Psalm 1 tells us. That the, the scriptures and the word of God actually transforms us from the inside out. My daughter told me not to move too much. Am I okay, Ella? Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting the evil eyes. 
Then what we talked about was invest. Uh, Pete shared some stuff at the prayer meeting. And everyone's welcome to that meeting, by the way. We want to pray before the meeting. To say, God, won't you come and do what you need to do? By your spirit, won't you come and empower and anoint and do what you need to do? And Pete was saying this week, he got to a place where he said, God, I, I can't do anything here. It's all about you. You need to come and do what you need to do. And there's a place where we invest and we risk that we actually go and we, we say, when we pray for somebody, like, like I know Pete's just had a fall and he's broken, not broken, Lord, no. He's hurt his ankle. He's twisted his ankle. Well, maybe you're sick in your body. What we're risking is, Lord, I, I want to take what you say right now. I'm going to demonstrate this. I'm risking now because if God doesn't heal, I'm going to look like a pauper, hey? Maybe not because maybe Pete walks away loved and that's the whole point, isn't it? But actually, maybe God can heal Pete's ankle right now because he, he fell. So I, I anoint his ankle in the name of Jesus because that's what it says. Call on the elders to come and anoint with oil and to pray a prayer of faith and the prayer of a righteous person prevails much and is far-reaching. And Lord, thank you that your name is above every name, that everything, authority on heaven and earth has been given to you, that you send your word and it does not return void from that which you've sent it to accomplish. And so God, I can stand here and I can declare healing over Peter, not in my own standing, but in the righteousness that God has given me. Huh. Now I've stepped out and I've risked and I've invested. And if God doesn't come through, but we need to start doing that, actually following what Jesus is saying. Because some of the stuff we don't, we don't like, do we? Jesus calls us to be generous givers. Jesus calls us to be servants. Jesus calls us to be all of these things. And we have to invest because we go, but God, I don't have the time. But actually God has called us to invest in those things that if God doesn't come through. And what we do is we work ourselves to the bone because we don't believe that God's going to provide. And yet what happens with the manna is the manna came for six days, but the seventh day there was enough to take you into the seventh day. But what we do is we oh, lack limits. Not even in my notes. I don't know where they came from. All right. Rest in what God has done. See, what we do is we go, okay, God has said these things. God has, has birthed us in and, and has given a promise. But now, God, you're not doing it quick enough. Let me help you. So what we do is if you, ever, if you plant something and you dig it up a month later, what do you do to it? Yeah, you kill it. Let God do what he needs to do because he needs that time. See, time harvest. <clears throat> it's a principle. So what we do is we want to help God. And then I, I spent a bit of time, which I'm going to spend on now, is accept your death. Not your leaving Project Planet Earth, but your spiritual death. The old man is dead. The flesh is dead. Yes, it still kind of hangs around because you keep putting it back on. But the point is, is it's, it's about this thing of going to the cross, knowing that you're, you're being crucified with Christ. That you are dead to your selfish kind of ambitions and, and all of those kind of things. And, and in terms of this thing is death to self, Dallas Wood, I love this. Fleeing a life that is inferior of your old nature in favor of one of the kingdom of God. That alone will nourish and enable you to be the person that God wants you to be. And in reality, the person that you actually want to be too. And that's the beauty of dying to self. Because we always see it as generally a negative thing, don't we? Dying, I mean, dying, death, it's not a positive thing. But actually, it's not about numbing ourselves and shutting ourselves down and becoming nothing or nobody. It's actually a great alternative. And actually, the, the alternative that God created us to, to live in and to be. And so, in, it's important for us to understand that when we die to solve, what we do is we step into the drama of God and into the flow of God and what He's created us for. And this is all stuff that I've preached on three weeks ago, but I'm needing just to set the foundation for it. And in that process, sin becomes unattractive because it's like, it's like bees. Bees go where there's pollen. If there's no pollen, the bees don't go there. And so when we understand this whole thing that righteousness is not about, uh, oh, I, I'm, just, I'm not doing the bad things anymore. No, it's about our trajectory and about what we're doing is redirecting our lives towards living out the kingdom of God. I love what Dallas Willard said, and I know he passed away in 2013. But he said he believes that one day he'll die, and then he, it'll be a couple of weeks before he realizes he's actually died. Because he's living in the kingdom of God continually. And that's what we are called to do. And then we shift our reality to the kingdom of God. And read this with me. See, this whole thing is about that there's an unseen realm out there. We can only walk in the unseen realm of the kingdom of God if we are born again of the Spirit and born into, the, in, in a sense, the unseenness of what we are called into. The spiritual world is way more reality than our physical world that we've been created for time. God lives outside of that. 
But the thing is, God is bringing out of human history a redeemed people that will forever stand as testimony of his greatness. Go read Romans 8, the most beautiful thing, that the whole universe is going to be brought into our salvation. And we will rule with God going forward. Just think about that for a moment. And we'll have the new bodies. We won't have twisted ankles anymore. Anyway, I've got, I must get, must get distracted. The kingdom of God is what we were made for and where we belong. And it's not just a great alternative. It's actually the greatest thing we could ever ask for. Yet we fight against it so much. It's like going to gym, isn't it? It's like exercising. It's good for you. Most people think a lot about exercise but never actually go do it. But we know that when we are with Jesus, it benefits us. When we go exercise, it benefits us. All right. So for this morning, the reason why we're doing this series is because we want to show you that Jesus is way more amazing than you even thought possible. And that's why we, we went through that meta-narrative, the whole big Bible story of what Jesus has actually done for us. That it's not just about dying for our sins, which is amazing, but it's actually about so much more. And I'm not going to go into those things. Go and listen to the series if you haven't. And what is important there is that then we respond to the bigness and the greatness of what Jesus has done for us. What, what, what am I saying? Okay. Story of a little boy who starts charging his mother for everything that he's doing around the house. So when he does the dishes, he charges her 10 bucks. When he that, cleans up his room, he charges her 10 bucks. That takes out the, the rubbish, another 10 bucks. Goes to his mom and says, Mom, you owe me 50 bucks. So the mom writes a little letter and she says to him, You know what? For carrying you for nine months, charge zero. For staying up with you when you were sick on all those multiple times and caring for you and nursing you, charge zero. For taking you to all your sporting events, time and time again as mom's taxi, charge zero for working those extra hours and overtime to buy you those tennis shoes that you desperately needed to compete, charge zero. Love, Mom. What do you think that little boy did when he read that note? He went, oh, my goodness, look at what my mom has done in comparison how I've responded. Actually, these small things are insignificant. And so he left the 50 bucks and went and did the chores because he saw the greatness to which his mom it served him. Think of what Jesus has done for us. Then when he calls us into this place, we understand that there's a, there's a bigness of God and, a, and, a, and a, a, a massive cost that God has paid to bring us back into a right relationship with him. Then the small things that he's asking for us pay, fade into insignificance. See, Jesus paid for our sin. He's reconciled us back to the Father. He forgives our sins. All we simply do is respond to the invitation to come into eternal life, which he provides for us. And he's overcome the power of sin and death. So in all of this stuff, our response to some of the small things he asks us to do should really be easy if we have a revelation of what he's done for us. So I want to show you this crazy video. Now, I thought it was a joke, but it turns out it's not a joke. Our world has gone mad. We know that, right? So, Ray, if you can... Play that video, please. I mentioned in my last video that I went clothes shopping for my children, and a lot of people are shocked to hear that I have children, considering I sued my parents for having me without my permission. But I just want to make a couple of things clear here. So my parents that I sued, they contributed to, you know, conceiving me, and my mother that raised me, she gave birth to me, um, and that's why I sued them, because I did not consent to being here. Like I was unaware that I was going to have to grow up and get a job um, to support myself. And I, I just didn't consent to that. They didn't try to contact me in any way before I was born to see if I actually wanted to be here. Um, and that's why I sued them. Now it's different. Like I know I've said it's like unethical to have children before, but it's different when you adopt because it's not my fault that they're here. I'm just trying to be a good person and, like, help them out. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, if you are pregnant right now, 
you need to go, you need to hire a psychic medium and ask your child if they actually want to be here. Um, but keep in mind, if they don't, you, you need to terminate. Otherwise, they will sue you because I'm making that my life mission to teach children to sue their parents so they don't have to work. Um, but yes, that I do have children, but I adopted them. So I had them in like an ethical way. Now, there's follow-up videos on that, which will blow your mind, which I won't go into. But if you go search it on YouTube or whatever, you'll find out this is how crazy our world has become. It's like, I don't want to work, so I'm going to sue my parents so I don't have to work. So she actually won the initial case, by the way. And then in, on appeal, she's lost it, and then she, she cries about it. But anyway, that's the other thing. <laughs> now, if discipleship is living my life as Jesus would live my life, then one of the things and one of the biggest principles is servanthood or serving others as well as serving God, right? Because Jesus is the epitome of that. As a part of discipleship, if you're not willing to be a servant, if you're not willing to work, if you're not willing to, in a sense, serve others and serve God, well, you actually cannot walk in your discipleship and you cannot move in the Eden mandate that we've been called to, which is to disciple the nations. And so it's important for us to understand that because in the context of Matthew 20, Jesus says, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Now the context there is, is the sons of Zebedee, James and John. She's, she comes up to Jesus and says, Have you, haven't you got a special place for my sons? And Jesus goes through this process and ultimately talks about the fact that it's about serving. And the first will be last and all those good things because it's actually about serving others and with humility coming underneath and lifting others up and not lifting up yourselves. But I'll get into that in a moment. See, this whole thing is that you might be born a son or a daughter, even spiritually, but you have to work to become a servant. It's a process. It takes time. And in this modern age, we want everything instantaneously, don't we? You, you name it. We want, we want everything now. Like, why do we have to wait? You know, even if our internet is a little bit slow, we get frustrated. Eh? Um, the, the, the signal on our phones, we've got these phones we can walk around anywhere. Do you remember those days? Zero, one, one, four, oh. I mean, hey? And then you get it wrong. You, your finger would get caught and you'd have to start it going, ah. Remember those things where we had our telephone numbers, you had to push this thing and this thing flopped up and you could put it down to ABC, okay, there. I mean, there are so many things that the previous generations have no idea of. Norma Rasa Vlif, et cetera, you know. But here's an, an example. is like, who remembers this? I mean, when Louise and I went overseas at the end of the 90s, that's what we had. We had a Pentax camera and we had these rolls of film and you had to make sure that light didn't get in and expose it. Because it actually had to be developed, and that development process took quite a while, didn't it? Like you'd have to go in, and I think it's nine steps in a dark room where you couldn't expose it to light too early, and, and you had all of this processing to make sure that the negatives weren't exposed because it would take away the, the actual film, and then you did this process, and then you had this thing, and then you put it onto a piece of paper and photographic paper, and then you had your photograph. Now you just click. Done deal. And probably a better photo than that camera could ever take. Instantaneous, isn't it? Not waiting for the development. And now the problem is, is that what happens in our lives today is that uh, we want everything right now. Now, can you imagine? I mean, I don't know about you, but when you sit with people who've kind of been around for a while. Like, I, I love sitting with, uh, with Roy Edwards, Annalisa's husband. Because he is a wealth, he's like an encyclopedia. You should go speak to him about global warming, and he'll tell you it's the biggest load of rubbish that you've ever come across. But anyway, go speak to him about it, because he's researched this stuff, and he's a bright man. And I love listening to him on various topics, even on religion, because he has these kind of insights into different things. And he can show me photographs of when he was all over the, the map in terms of, of being the, the geologist that he is. Now, can you... Imagine sitting with older people in 50 years' time, 
He has a great picture of me and my breakfast. He has a picture of the shoes that I almost bought. We laugh. But instantaneous. Oh, he has a great picture of, I mean, the other night we were blessed to go away for a, for a dinner. And, and the table next to us, there's this lady taking pictures of her food. Not talking to the spouse. I don't think they said a word to each other the whole night, but there she is taking pictures of the food. Look at my life. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be bizarre. That's all I know. We do that the same thing spiritually, don't we? It's like, give me the prophetic word that's going to change the trajectory of my life. It's the silver bullet. Take me into a counseling session or a freedom session because they are going to help me. Let me go to that conference because I know if I go to that conference or if I go to that church, that church has got what, it, what for me. Instead of actually, I love the fact that there are people that have been around in this church from the days that it started. The Morgan family, for example. Ron Barlow. Right from day one, they were in the lounge in the Morgans' home on our first time that we met. Faithful. Has it been easy for them? No. Have, have, have Louise and I disappointed them? Yes. Once? No. Many times. But what I'm saying is through relationship and through what God has called us into, when we stick around and we do what he's called us to and we serve one another, that's when God starts to do stuff. But what we want to do is not instantaneous. Oh, I'm not feeling great today. So you know what? I'm going to go to another church or I'm going to go and do this or I'm going to go to that conference and I, and I hope, I know that, that God's going to meet me there. How can we be so dwarf and still breathe? No, it's in the development room. It's in the dark room. It's in the lonely place with God. The silence and the solitude. Hearing the still small voice. Being developed by God over time rather than the snap, lodge, snap, snap, snap and upload. Let me snap and upload. Give me a prophetic word so I can snap and upload in my spirituality to get to where I want to. We live in a ghastly age of all of that. Now, you don't need God to discover you. Do you know that he created you? <laughs> he doesn't need to discover you. But what you want to, unfortunately, in the context of our discipleship and our servanthood, is we only want to serve where we sing. I want to thank you for those who serve behind the scenes diligently, Without notice. They are, they are the children's ministry people. They are the people on the AV. You only notice them when something goes wrong. The, the worship teams yesterday are seen, but you don't know all the stuff that goes behind that. Go, go and try to learn how to play guitar or, or, or piano or keyboard. See how long it takes you. It, the, the amount of time that's put into the practice and all of those kind of things. All behind the scenes that nobody else sees. They just see one moment. And in all of this stuff is we want men to discover us. But you know what? If you are looking for men to discover you or women to discover you, it will actually destroy you because you will spend the rest of your life trying to perform so that those people will be happy with your performance. Whereas God says to Jesus before he's performing, you are my son whom I love and I'm and well pleased with you. I choose you. Yes, I've got things for you to do and Jesus obviously did that perfectly. But if we bypass that development process that God wants to take us into that dark room and we are looking for man's affirmation, we will be destroyed because God wants to develop a light in us that when the light and the spotlight comes upon us, that light in us is greater than the spotlight on us. Because if the spotlight is greater than what's in us, it will destroy us. The problem with social media and all these things, it puts a spotlight on us and maybe too soon. And maybe you guys, and part of the serving is, where do you serve within a local community? Where do you serve in your home? Where do you serve in the workplace out there? But if you're wanting to serve where there's the spotlight before you've developed the inward light, be very careful because something will go wrong. And so part of this process is to make sure that the light in us is greater than. And the one way that we get developed is to serve behind the scenes. See, God always looks from the inside out, doesn't he? Because Proverbs 4.23, I think it is, says that guard your heart because out of it, everything of life flows. Everything. 
And you know that if you've got a, a, a disparity between what's inside and what's outside, and we put up these masks and we engage each other based on masks, the surface community stuff, there's a point that out of the heart, the, the mouth will speak. When the toothpaste tube gets squeezed, condensed milk does not come out. And so what starts to happen is if we don't deal with that and there's this disparity, then what we do is we start to find satisfaction in other things rather than in God and go through the development process because we want the quick snap. We want the quick upload as opposed to going through the development process that God's called us into, that we are forged into the image of Jesus and the light within us is greater than the spotlight that will be on us at some point in the future. See, what are you willing to do when no one's watching? Are you willing to serve when there's no real accolades? Where, where nobody knows what you're doing, but you know God has called you into the space and you're doing it because you're doing it for the Lord. Because if you can't do it, then there's something wrong. And the problem is, is that if at some point you get released into the spotlight, it will crush you. And we've seen that. How many, I mean, we could probably name 20 people that if I asked, okay, think of religious leaders who have fallen. I want to look like God not get likes on social media. And I'd rather be marked by God than marked by men. And I don't know what your story is, but I know, I know God said to me some years ago, Gary, I'm hiding you for a season. And boy, this has been a tough season. It's been way longer than I ever thought. I don't know if it's ended yet, but he's kept me in the space and I'm in the dark room. And I'm still being forged into the image of Jesus. I've still got lots of stuff that needs to be dealt with. But I believe there will be a point in time that God will release me into what he spoke over me way back when I was a young boy. I, don't, I haven't walked in much of that at all yet. And it's not for my glory, it's for the glory of God. So John 13, we all know the scripture. I'm not going to read through it. It's up there, you want to read, go for it. But the beautiful thing is, is when you look at this, just notice that when Jesus is having dinner with the disciples, now remember how they used to do it. Now we think of dinner. We sit at a table, knives and forks, golden service, silver service. Come waiter, come pour me drinks. No, they sat on the floor. But think about that. When you sit down, what comes up? Your stanky feet. What's next to your plate? Your stanky feet. You're wearing sandals. You're walking on dust roads. They didn't have tar roads then. Can you imagine the toe jam? No, I'm painting a picture. This is why you had people washing people's feet, and I'm going to get into that in a moment. But interestingly, isn't it, it's got a couple of things. It talks about Judas being there, who was about to betray Jesus. It talks about the fact that Jesus has all power that has been given to him. And yet, what does he do? He chooses the place of the lowly servant undresses and puts the towel around him, which is actually a servant thing, and washes his disciples' feet. Now, this is what he says. He says, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And very truly, I will tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Wow. So Jesus is showing us that actually the greater way to do things is to serve one another. And by doing that, we are serving him and God. So going back to the foot washing. Think of, think of those feet and what they look like. They're not in shoes like ours. They're nasty. And yet Jesus chooses to do that because generally it was the lowliest of the servants that would do that. Now obviously we arrived there and nobody had washed their feet and everyone would be looking around thinking, who's going to wash my feet? I mean, I'm sitting here with my feet up at my plates. How, who's going to do this for me? And then Jesus gets up and you go, whoops, hold on a second. Inconvenient. Because often serving somebody else is inconvenient. And there's a cost to it. 
And sometimes you have to take some stuff off to be able to serve somebody. But it was mainly for hygiene purposes, which I've, I've clearly painted a, a decent picture because JP's... Uh, it was also for hospitality and social, which is what was happening here too. Was when you have somebody over for dinner, you make sure you wash their feet so that it's part of the process of what you do when you welcome somebody. And then there were a whole bunch of religious rituals, which I won't go into. But the point is, is that think about what's happening here. Number one, Jesus is washing Judas' feet despite the fact that he's about to betray him. Interesting, no? So actually serving others isn't dependent on whether or not they're worthy of it or not. God's called us to do it out of a place of obedience and be his example. Not so easy, hey? It's a sign of humility. James 4 talks about humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So part of this process is that when we wash feet, what do we do? We literally get on our knees. We get down. There's a posture of humility. I don't have all the answers, guys. I wish I did. I don't. I know between me and my brother we do, but Scott's in Scotland, so you'll have to give him a call if I don't know the answer. I don't know if Scott's listening online. We used to say that to people a lot. It's a selfless act, isn't it? And and Peter speaks about that. Peter Paul speaks about that in Philippians two, and that Philippians two, he says they do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but the interests of the, of of each other, uh, their own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. So actually, as believers and as disciples of Jesus, we should be living for the benefit of others. That's really what it's saying. So how do we do that with one another and in the context of our our church family life house, in the context of your own family, in the context of the workplace that you find yourself in? And I'm not going to go into the rest of that text. But did you notice, hopefully you did because I underlined it and I bolded it. And part of that, what I'm trying to say is that authority is given, if you look at that, authority is linked to servanthood. So authority that God gives me is not for myself, but it's actually for the benefit of you and for others around me. We see what happens when people think it's for themselves. We just look at our government. Look at the governments of this world. When people come into a place of of authority, what do they do? They, They build for themselves. They feather their own nest rather than look after the people that actually put them in their place to actually lead them into the future that really they should have been doing. So interesting that authority facilitates the governmental flow. Now think about that for a moment. If, if you put it into a, 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 a governmental context, and let's take South Africa, imagine if our government, instead of feathering their own nest, actually allowed to happen what happens, that as the taxes came in, they put the money into the areas and built the infrastructures and the stuff that they should have done in the first place. Where would our country be? It's the same thing as the kingdom. Is that when we have authority and we operate in that in the, in the right way through the faith in God, what happens is, is we start to build the kingdom around us. Not the church, the kingdom. We're not trying to build church. We're trying to build kingdom. The church is just a vehicle for which we build the kingdom in conjunction with others. I love what Kerry said. Come out on the 20 whatever of July to the Four Ways Pastors Connect. We are connecting with churches in this area. We are not the only church. Let's not be, oh, we're all good, me, myself, and I, life house. Woo-hoo. No. We are connected with others. Let's go and worship with them. Let's go and connect with them. Let's do this together as, as the church of, of Johannesburg. Not all the churches, clearly, but certainly those ones that we connect with, where our hearts are connected. When we have our catalyst times, those are churches beyond us. So this is our Jerusalem. What about Samaria and the outer parts of the world? Dale and Jordan are going to the outer parts of the world. Why are we doing that? I've heard, oh, why are we spending money sending people to Ukraine? When we do this, do stuff, yeah, man. No, because it's to Jerusalem, to Samaria, and to the outer parts of this world. It's all, all at once. Not, oh, just this one, and then just this one. No, it's all of this. Go and disciple the nations. That includes your next door neighbor, but it also includes the Ukraine. Am I getting a bit heavy this morning? Now, the thing about authority, it's often referred to as anointing, isn't it? And in the Old Testament, what they would do is they would go and they would anoint with oil. You look at King Saul. I mean, literally, it wasn't just like what we do, like with Peter now. They literally pour oil over you. That's why Psalm 133, when there's anointing over the priest of Aaron, and it goes, it talks about going down his beard. And when there's unity amongst the brothers, God commands his blessing in his life. 
So you are called to keep the unity of the Spirit in this community and beyond. And that's why gossip and slander are so bad. Because it undermines the very thing that God wants to do. And it breaks down what God's trying to do. And then his life and his blessing are no longer there. The thing about anointing is it's sovereign. God goes, okay, I'm going to anoint a new king because Saul's messed up. I'll get to that in a moment. And he goes to the house of Jesse. And Jesse lines up his sons. And Samuel goes, anyone here got? No. Jesse, do you have another son? Oh, oh yeah, David. Yeah, he's in the field. His father didn't even think he was allowed to be considered in the lineup. Hmm. But God sovereignly anoints him. God sovereignly anointed Jesus. And you can see the text up behind me. He anointed Jesus to do all of what he did to do all the good that he did, to do all the healings he did. See, authority and servanthood are linked in such a, such a way that if you're not willing to be a servant, then the anointing that God puts on your life will be this big. The more you serve, the more anointed you become. I've had men, part of this community, come and say, I just want to preach. I don't want to, I don't want to engage people. I'll pastor them from the pulpit. I bore. We're not going to do it like that. No, because it's about relationship. Because authority comes through relationship. Anointing comes through relationship. Touching people's lives online, on social media, just because they're a friend on my, my, my Facebook page is not going to cut it in God's economy. How do we lay hands on somebody through Facebook? <laughs> what did you say? Our five. five, yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing about King Saul, which I said I was going to come back to. He was anointed as king. Now he's waiting for Samuel to come and do the sacrifice before they go into battle. Samuel doesn't arrive, so what does he do? He steps into a place that he's not anointed for, and guess what happens? He loses his anointing as king as a result, and it's given to David. So in many ways, God has anointed us for specific things. Like I've often said from this pulpit, I've always wanted God to anoint me as a worship leader. He didn't. If I get up here and I start leading worship, I think most of you would leave. And even though I know I can hold a key here and there and whatever else, I realize that's not my gifting. God hasn't given me an anointing to do that. As much as I think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a David-spirited person and I love worship, I'm sure some people, after, when I look around, no one's near me. I think they're going, oh, she was singing out a key again. The point is, is like, to, to stay in our lanes and understand what God has called us to. What about the sons of Sceva? I missed that one. They think they can go and hoy with delivering guys from demons, and one oak smashes them and strips them naked. Why? Because they, they weren't anointed for that task. So what are these things, the types of anointing, the ascension gifts? Ephesians chapter 4. Now, if we look at Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about equipping the saints and edifying the body of Christ. These are the apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, etc. It's only given to some. Not all of you are given that gift. But some of us are called into that space. I know what God's called me into that space, and I will let him demonstrate that through the rest of my life if he keeps me on Project Planet Earth. I'm not going to say, hey, I'm an evangelist. Hey, I'm an apostle. Hey, I'm a teacher. No, God will demonstrate that through the fruit of what I do in equipping the saints for the works of service. What about redemptive gifts? Now, they're found throughout the Bible, but Romans 12 is one of the places where it is. What are those things? Well, look at those things. We're talking about everything from prophecy to faith to um, exhortation to leading to cheerfulness. Do you know that cheerfulness is a, is a gift? It's a redemptive gift. I remember walking into my boss's office, Trevor, who's no longer with us, and I'm hoping you're in heaven, Trevor. But he never, I never heard him confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But I don't know, maybe he did. I, I'm hoping he did because I do want to meet up with him again. But I remember walking into his office when I was at Lloyd and I was under huge pressure. And he said, Gary, you sound like Eeyore. As, as believers, we shouldn't be Eeyore. We should be Tiggers. <gasps> if I told you the week I had, and I won't, but if I told you the week I had, I, I almost had a heart attack a few times. My 
computer crashed and a whole bunch of things. And I was like, what just happened? Lost information. How am I going to get this back? Got it back. I won't explain all of that. But I'm going, oh, I had a bad week. My name is Eeyore. See, I do it so well. And I can, I can quickly relegate myself into that. But we need to be a T.I. double garage, you know? Otherwise, we're in trouble. The point is, is we are called, and those redemptive gifts are actually for beyond us. They're actually for that when you go to work, when you go in that. Nobody wants to be around a sulky Sue or a, somebody who's been sucking lemons their whole life or has the face they deserve. Thirdly, we get anointed through gifts of, of the Spirit. Holy Spirit comes and gives us gifts. 1 Corinthians 12. I wish I could spend more time on this because this is so cool stuff. But you know that what I honestly believe is God will only dispense that if you are, have a posture of a servant. Why would God give you a gift? Because it's like giving a baby a power tool. If your posture is not to serve people, but it's for yourself. And you might have that for a season because the spotlight will be on you, but it'll crush you. Again, we could mention a whole bunch of people that we've seen you know, throughout the world and even probably people you know because the light in them was not greater than the spotlight on them. But words of wisdom, the, the prophetic, the interpretation of tongues, all of those good things, we see all of that in, in, in look at that, distinguishing by spirits, uh, interpretation of tongues, and it distributes to them each one just as he determines. And I believe he will determine it if you are serving. If you come into the church and you think you're a big deal and you just start prophesying, I don't know that I'm going to listen to you. But if I see you serving, I'm going to think twice about what you're saying to me. Because I know that you love me and I know that you care for me. And so if you do come and give me a directive word which I don't like, I'm going to listen to it. All right, we're getting there. So, interestingly, that if we go to Galatians chapter 5, look at that, where it talks about the works of the flesh, but it's the fruit of the Spirit. Huh. How many of you can produce fruit? <coughs> we can maybe produce lemons, lemon juice, make lemonade. But the point is, none of us can produce fruit. Fruit is produced because we are rooted in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit comes because we are rooted in Jesus and in Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit is living within us and expressing himself out of us. What is one of the fruits of the Spirit? Self-control. How many of you are trying to self-control yourself? How's it going? What about you? There's stuff in my life. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have that packet of chips. Maybe I shouldn't have that chocolate. No, I want it. If we are not with Jesus, being with him, becoming like him, then we won't have the fruit of self-control. No matter how hard you try, you will not have the power of the kingdom to overcome that. You will continually go back into that because it's not a fruit, because you're not with the Spirit. Whereas works of the flesh is a work. You actually have to work pretty hard to produce the rubbish that your flesh once produced before you were saved, to go back and dig up your old man and put him on your back so that you can actually walk her out. Hmm. As Pete says. Then you've got the translocal anointing. We've seen guys come into Greg Stevens, Sue Stevens, Ryan Matthews, Wesley Paul Venus, others. When, when Willem goes, I, I, I know that, that, that Quinton, when, when he went, according to uh, when he went with Willem and Leanne went, I know that God anointed them for the task at hand. They didn't, they didn't go with like, yeah, I'm the greatest. I'm... In fact, I know that some that went there with thinking, Gee, what am I going to give? I'm, I'm just this. But actually, that's what God wants. Because he will anoint you for the function, the task of going because there's a translocal gift on your life and you will go into that locality and you will change. Let me rephrase that. The Holy Spirit will work through you and change others. Simply because you went and you were anointed for the task. But you know what will stop that is familiar, familiarity. What did Jesus do? Jesus goes to his hometown and it says he could do very few miracles. Why? Because they didn't accept him for who he was. He was anointed to bring about those things. We just saw that text in Acts 10, right? 
But he goes into his hometown. He can't do any of that. Why? Because they didn't receive him for what he was. So actually part of what we do is, do we recognize people in what they're anointed in? Because if we do and we submit, because it says submit one to another, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, I think it is. Yes. If we don't do that, it doesn't, we all go, all go to the next verse. Husbands, I mean, wives, submit to your husbands. No, man. Submit one to another out of reverence to Christ. So if we submit to what we see in somebody else, that, God, that is the culture of honor. That is going, here is somebody who, who, who has been anointed for this particular task. If you don't see me particularly as the leader of this church, please leave. And I, and I don't say that, I promise you I don't say that lightly. Why? Because if you don't see the anointing of God over my life, you will not receive from me what I have for you. If I don't see the anointing over Anthony's life with the prophetic, and let me say prophet that I think God's bringing him into, I'm not going to receive from him when he comes and interprets a dream for me. Are we seeing each other in that? Are we submitting one to another? Am I, if I go on a trip, and I'm hoping I'm going to go in in September down to KZN, when I go on that trip, I will submit to Willem. Why? Because he is, he is the one leading this. The fact that I lead this church doesn't mean I lead that. I go, I see the evangelistic gifting on him, and I go with everything I can to learn from him. And to, and to appropriate, because why? I submit him to who he is. And I acknowledge the gift and the anointing over his life. But if you stay in the church and you don't recognize that, you start to gossip and you, why is he there? Why is she there? Why is she doing that? Why is he doing that? And what you do is you create a cancer in the local community and you kill it. Either through jealousy, which is actually from the pits of hell, or through this process of kind of being offended because it's not you. And that's why Jesus couldn't do miracles. The son of God who could, he went to places and he, it says that he healed all. He goes to the place where people are familiar with him and they go, oh no, you're Mary and Joseph's son, huh? I'm not going to receive from you. And they got Zippo. But God has anointed people in this community and beyond it in terms of translocal. If we don't see the Ryan Matthews and the et cetera, as people we want to receive from, that they're anointed for the task to help us mature as a, as a local body, we will receive nothing from them. And you know what? When I submit, when, and I, I'm hoping I'm going to speak it, that I'm going on that trip down to KZN, is that when I submit into Willem, and I go on that trip, guess what? I receive from him and we both go up. Because he will trust me too and bring me alongside and we'll go minister together, side by side like the disciples. Is that not what God has called us into? And that's why that's what the culture of honor is. Now to finish off, it's been longer than I wanted to. I said to Louise, I'm going to be short this morning. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. I love the fact, like my, my, my prayer is to be like David, that God will say, Gary Bradshaw achieved the purposes I had from him in his generation. That's, that's my, my hope. That's my heart's call. David was a man after God's own heart. I've had it prophesied over me many times that I am a, a, a kind of Davidic expression. I love worship. I don't understand why people don't love worship. Even when people are howling, it doesn't matter. There's something about stepping into when, when everybody is just all eyes on Jesus. For me, when I'm not here on a Sunday because I'm away, I want to be here. And I mean that. It's not, I, I don't try and not be here. I, I try and be here if I can. I even use my, when we ask Louise, whenever we go away, I will go away on Monday. I won't go away on Sunday. I'll go away on Monday and come back Saturday. And if, if, it's, if it's two weeks, then I'll come back the following Saturday. So I only miss one Sunday. I'm not saying that anyone has to do that, but for me, I, this is my home. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to be with my, my brothers and sisters to worship God. So King David has this testimony of being a man after God's own heart. Now, I know I've got a lot of things up there, so forgive me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just focus on one or two. But like I said, I've already said this. His own father didn't consider him, right? He's anointed as king. It took him 15 to 20 years before he walked in the fullness of that. 15 years for when he took over from Saul. And then when he got all the, the kingdoms of Israel back together was another couple of years. 
So that's how long it took him. Now, now we can go, what has God spoken over your life? And maybe you're going, God, what are you doing? It hasn't happened, and, I'm, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and I want to help him, and Burmak a plan, and all those kind of things. Do you not think that God will be able to find you wherever you are to bring you into the spotlight when that due time happens? But you need to be ready, just like the parable of the talents, right? What, with the one with the one talent? Oh, no, I was scared, and I was fearful of you, so I buried it. What did he say? You wicked, lazy servant? Now, even if you feel you're a one-talented per- person, Go and invest it in a local community. That's what, the, that's what it's talking about there. Go and invest yourself in a local community and get behind somebody who's maybe more anointed than you and maybe God will actually increase your talents more than you think. Look at all of these things. He was anointed to be king, but he spends his time in the palace playing a harp for the king who is now no longer anointed and he's having to bring his anointing to bring up the depression or to deal with the depression in Saul. But he learns to be a king because he was a shepherd. God brings him into the palace. He's anointed, but he has to take lunch to his brothers. Wow. A little bit of a lonely task for an anointed king. He learns faithfulness through that process. What else does he learn? He's a fugitive. God, what's happened? You said I would be king, but actually the king's chasing me to kill me. He learns to push through. He learns not to quit. He learns to trust in God. You know that after Ziklag, which I've spoken of down here, he encourages himself in the Lord. They go and track down the Amalekites who've who've stolen all their stuff and their wives. And what does he do? A week later, he's king. A week later. He's running with his men from, he was supposed to be fighting against Saul, depending on your theology on this, with the Philistines. Now he's all of a sudden king. And so through all of these things, acting as a madman, Jealousy of Saul, knowing that he won't be like that. His wisdom about not killing Nabal. Remember Abigail's husband who was a tonsil? All of these things, look at them. There's so many. But he learned to submit. He could have killed Saul. He could have removed Saul. He could have been king quick. But he knew not to touch what God had anointed until God actually released him into it. And so with all of this, my last thought is it all starts with being a servant. If you are being called into what God has called you into, It all starts with being a servant. God's preparing all of us to become that which we already are. What has he called you into? What has he called you into? In your workplace. Are you the person that when somebody says, hey, I need help, are you first to jump in? In your home, kids, teenagers, yeah, I'm speaking to you. Are you cleaning up your rooms? Are you part of the process of serving your parents who've served you for so long? Or is no, I've got to do that. It's the teenage walk when they're not happy. Are you cleaning your rooms? Are you helping take out the trash? Are you doing all of those things? Or is it like, oh no, mom and dad are there. Are you making your bed? These are important things because when you go out into the big wide world, guess what? Mommy and daddy aren't going to be there to do it for you. In our day and age, our mommies and daddies are doing way too much for us. And in South Africa, we've got domestic workers who actually are unhelpful from a point of view of our kids grow up to be sport brats. And then they have to wash their own dishes. And then you walk into their home after they've, they've kind of come out of home and you go, what just happened? We've got to teach our kids to be able to take care of themselves. And then lastly, with Lifehouse. I'd ask Willem and I'd ask Louise for a list of ministries, but that's actually irrelevant. My question is, are you serving in this community? Because if you're not, don't expect God to release you into what he's called you into. Oh, I want to be in the worship team. Okay, but have you built relationships? Oh, I want to be on this and I want to be on the finance team. Are you tithing? No, you've been on the finance team when you don't believe in tithing. And let's go through that process and let's chat why I believe in tithing. Because this doesn't just happen. You know, it doesn't go, oh, jeez, look at that building, eh? We've got salaries to pay. We've got people who do all the kinds of stuff. You come here during the week and watch JP and Charmaine. They are like, Chickens without heads, trying to look after all this stuff. The, the mowing of the grass, the planting of the trees, the, all of this stuff happens, but it actually costs money to be able to create this for you. So please don't come here and receive religious goods and services. If that's what you want, then quite, I'm being honest. Go find it somewhere else. Because we want to be a, a house of servants. Because if we are serving, we are like Jesus. And if we are like Jesus and we are living our lives out like him, 
then the sky's the limit and the things that we can't even imagine will come about because God is with us. Let's be the servant of all like Jesus was. Because if Jesus showed us how to do it, surely he can empower us through Holy Spirit to do these things. And the fruit of our lives will be demonstrated to the world out there and to one another as we love on each other and as we move into what God has called us into.